Stay up to date on the online stuff. No. Is there an article today? Yeah. I guess about the. I mean, it was sent to me. I think it was sent to me. Okay. And I don't know if it's the So yeah, 21 year old, that would be oh, that would right be. in my kids. Yeah. Well, and then my, my third child was two years behind my daughter. He graduated in 19. Okay. Um, so it's, now I feel like I, I know these like young 20 something names, you know? That yeah. <laughs>
5 o'clock. I'm going to call this uh, meeting to order. And we're going to have our invocation first. And City Manager Scott Meyer is going to lead us in our invocation. Please. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come together. Uh, we thank you for your servants who have um, volunteered and serve your city and lord we ask that you would be with them as they make decisions today and give them guidance and honor father we are thankful for every person that has come out uh, to uh, participate in our government in our city and ask that you'd give us all minds that are attentive to uh, each other and respectful in all ways it's in your son's name jesus we pray amen I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have no presentations this evening. Uh, we'll go right into communication and reports. Council? Um, first thing, I, I love seeing this audience, so thank you guys for coming. This is fantastic. The sea of yellow is just a wonderful thing to see, so thank you guys for coming out. Um, it's just good to see people engaging in government. It, it just doesn't happen enough, and so I like to see people asking questions and pushing to get their questions answered, and it's just really a fantastic thing. So thank you for coming out this evening. Thank you for making signs. Uh, it just shows that you're engaged and you're you're really working to be engaged and to get other people engaged so thank you guys very much for that um, on a completely different note and somewhat more of a neighborhood thing uh, this past saturday uh, twisted cat outdoors uh, chose cape gerardo for a catfish fishing tournament and i announced this last year because i thought it was so fantastic because it was right in the middle of ward one in uh, the red star neighborhood and they used the red star boat launch and so this year they had i think 56 anglers uh, take part and so that's actual boats. I think they actually had over six or over a hundred anglers uh, Multiple people per boat, but they pulled in somewhat like 2,000 pounds of catfish wow. and it, We forget how we're right on this incredible river and it's really a fantastic You know place for people to engage with nature especially when it comes to catfish fishing and I love to see all of these people in the Red Star neighborhood there were tons of boats and tons of people, and there were food trucks down on the Red Star boat dock, and it really was just a neat thing to see. So uh, just a, a good day in Red Star. It was beautiful weather. It was a little hot, but uh, just really thankful that that Twisted Cat Outdoors decided to come back to Cape Girardeau for another year. It was very hot. It was. Uh, I will say some of those boats were here two or three days before fishing and going up and down the river because I heard several people say they said what are all these boats going up and down the <laughs> river out here fishing all of a sudden and I said I think there's a tournament coming up and yes. lo and behold there was so it was good, good. <clears throat> anybody else a plug I know you or I, I know you gave a plug on it last weekend but I just wanted to talk about I had the opportunity to go the last two weeks to the series that's being put on by the gateway um, church here in town on race relations and it's really neat and I know that you the mayor and police chief participated in this last week um, did an amazing job but uh, they have several more weeks planned and it's very timely obviously around race relations but it, it forces you there it doesn't for it it uh, allows you to look through the lens of race relations and related to the church and that lens through um, the community through national politics etc it's just a great um, venue and a great avenue with which to, to begin those, or to have those conversations those very crucial conversations that need to be had in this time and um, I just encourage everybody to go there um, over the next couple weeks for that series as well so anybody else uh, I'll report we had a simple board meeting this week uh, had a report on the on the ADA pedestrian transportation infrastructure assessment project. So if you've seen people walking around sidewalks with little vests on and little meters measuring, 
That's what they're doing. They're looking at every sidewalk in the county uh, for infrastructure, infrastructure purposes and trying to put together a plan to uh, see if we can't do something with our pedestrian transportation. It's a neat project. Uh, and like he said, I did attend, uh, uh, again, the uh, Race Relations and Conserve America Symposium, and, and uh, Ben Porter's done a great job putting that together. Uh, I cannot be there this week. Uh, but but it will continue, and I think then you got another thing scheduled maybe later in August. I'm not sure what the schedule is after that, but it's it's been uh, it's been very 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 good. Uh, it's good to talk about issues and, and bring them out in the public and uh, get some ideas. I think they've been very good. I didn't have anything else, Scott. Uh, no, have nothing. Nothing to report. Uh, if not, we'll go right into items for discussion. The first is the P and Z report. Evening, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Myers, Council, uh, Patrick Ketting with the Planning Zoning Commission. I chaired the meeting last week. Um, we reviewed the Cape Vision 2040 comprehensive plan. Uh, the plan was presented by Michael Hoffman with Tesca Associates. The commission unanimously approved the draft plan with eight voting in favor. Um, we had a request by Thomas and Tori Shoemaker to rezone the property from R3 high density single family residential to CBD central business district at 1017 and 1019 Harmony Street. Uh, Mr. Schumacher plans to convert the existing building into a three unit apartment. Uh, we pass it unanimously with seven votes in favor. Uh, we had a zoning uh, Mid America Hotels Corporation is requesting the property to be annexed into the city. Uh, Dan Drury was available at the meeting for any questions. Staff recommends uh, the property at 4072 State Highway K uh, to be annexed and zoned C2. Uh, voted in favor, seven voting. 1506 Price Drive uh, fence height exception. Uh, Sven Svensson and Bonnie Coy Svensson requested an exception to allow an eight foot black chain link fence in the rear and side yards of her house to keep the deer out of their plants. Uh, we voted seven in favor, unanimous as well. Um, the Highlands at Hopper Crossing, phase three subdivision record plat. Plat shows 18 lots, 17 of which are single family uh, lots and one lot for stormwater detention pond, uh, as well as a new right of way to the extension of Lock Navarre Lane and the reconfigured portion of Collins Street. We voted seven in favor, unanimous as well. And Evans Castle Rock subdivision record plan. The plat uh, combines two existing lots to form one. Uh, seven in favor, unanimous. And the final is Eakin's first subdivision record plat. The plat combines three existing lots from, to form one new lot. We voted seven in favor and unanimous. Good, good meeting. Yes, we did. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Have Any a good evening. questions? I don't think so. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Gail is on vacation in the Smoky Mountains, and she is probably having a good time right now. <laughs> with a much needed vacation. She's been working her tail off. Broadway traffic study, findings regarding pedestrian paddle signs. Well, you are, is it that please? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, in 2019, uh, several pedestrian, yield to pedestrian signs were erected on Broadway at four intersections and crosswalks at Frederick Middle, Fountain, and Lorimer Streets. These were installed in response to complaints that we had received from some merchants along Broadway about pedestrians having difficulty finding a gap in the traffic to cross or difficulty with vehicles yielding as they should when someone is in a crosswalk. So the paddles were erected in the spring of 2019. We removed them in the fall before the holiday light parade and before snow season so that snow plows could traverse Broadway without any obstacles. Um, we've had a lot of feedback um, from people both in favor and opposition to the paddles. Um, as uh, council requested, we have done some additional studies to determine their effectiveness. Um, we did install them kind of as a trial basis. And so we've collected some additional data to help you decide whether or not we should continue with these uh, signs or whether we should remove them and look at some alternate strategies. So 
uh, first of all, in the report that I um, is in your pack, it was uh, some speed studies. We've conducted several speed studies along Broadway in 2016, 2019, and 2020. For all three of those studies, the volume of traffic has remained pretty consistent over the last several years, as has the speed. So in all three speed studies, um, we're finding that the average speed is approximately 20 miles per hour in both directions. Um, and that has been the same before the paddles and after the paddles were installed. So it doesn't appear to have much um, impact on, on the speed. The other thing that we looked at was the accident data. The police department pulled accident data for the last five years um, for all of, excuse me, Broadway. And we've had two pedestrian related accidents in that time frame. Both were um, caused by the activity of the pedestrian. One was a skateboarder who lost control and hit a parked car. And the other accident involved an individual who attempted to cross the street, not in a crosswalk, um, but came out from two vehicles that, um, so she was not via visible and was struck by a car. So again, uh, we haven't seen any change in those accidents as a result of the, the paddles either. Um, we also um, included some cost data for the signage. The cost spent to date is approximately $4,500. That includes the original cost of $2,168 for the purchase and initial installation, $1,626 for the replacement of damaged signs, and then about $736 in manpower cost to remove them in the fall and put them back up in the spring. Um, it should be noted that um, six of the original eight signs were replaced in 2019. There are currently three signs that are in need of replacement. Um, we have not done that until we have the outcome of this conversation this evening. You had also asked us to get input from Old Town Cape and the CID board. We did hear from Old Town Cape. They did include a letter of support, which is attached to your report. Um, we just wanted to note that the original request for the signs did come from an Old Town Cape board member. Um, so that is the information that we collected. We did not receive an official response from the CID board um, on, on their position of the signs, um, but that is the information that you asked us to collect. So this evening we're asking for a discussion um, from council and some direction as how you would like to proceed with the signs. Be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Their letter was specifically in support of these paddles, but their letter was more about the pedestrian oriented environment that we're trying to create and sustain in, in downtown Cape. And so I think that, um, I mean, I don't want to speak for Old Town Cape. Um, we, we asked them specifically about these signs and that's what they, their letter is in support of. I personally, I've always thought these signs have been a good benefit to Broadway. I think it slows down drivers. It, it facilitates pedestrian growth. And for anybody that's concerned, I even think it slows down drivers to see available properties. Um, I want to see some type of a reminder pedestrian slow sign. Now, the one thing I've heard from a lot of people are the general aesthetics of the paddle sign. And so if there are better options, um, something that might blend better with the aesthetic of Broadway that Old Town Cape is trying to facilitate. I, I would I would approve and appreciate that type of a feedback. And so I think if you know, kind of going forward, we have the ones in place now for this season. If we need to keep them in place until the end of this season, when they would naturally take them up in the fall, and then that gives us the entire winter and from here until then to to study to look find some aesthetically pleasing signs that maybe the Old Town Cape organization would be in approval of, and then we could kind of take it from there. Um, you know, I was loud about these signs, but I never said I thought that they were pretty. 
Um, I never, I never said that. Well, you well, know, a, a, a street sign doesn't have to be pretty. It just has to be effective. <laughs> you know, nobody ever I mean, like, oogles at a stop sign thinking yeah. about its beauty. But, uh, but the point was, was pedestrian safety and slowing down. And and I, I looked at this report, and and I appreciate staff getting the information together. You know, if you look at it, you know, one thing that I noticed is you have bus, bus and track tractor trailer traffic is down which would inherently make your your speeds go up however if you look the 85th percentile the last for this year was actually you know significantly less on going eastbound so i thought that was pretty interesting now i know it's it's not it's not a huge you know but five miles an hour one way on the 85th percentile is pretty significant i would think um Whatever we can come out of tonight, I would I would support that and us saying, hey, we'll wait till fall, take these down, and then we've got plenty of time to come up with a with a uh, um, something more aesthetically pleasing. So, I think that's also a good plan. I'm concerned about the cost, the ongoing cost to taxpayers of constantly replacing these signs. You know, we replaced six in 2019. They're 225 dollars a piece. If we have to keep doing that. You know, every year, every other year, it mounts up over time. Whereas, if you have a sign that's placed, you know, at a crosswalk, at the sidewalk level, it's not something you have to replace. It's not going to be hit all the time. And and I, I do think they're ugly when they've been hit and damaged and bent up and and you know they just look they don't look good. They we've got a beautiful downtown. We're we're doing all sorts of things to renovate our downtown and make it beautiful and make it look good. And then you've got something like this in the middle of the street that's all beat up and decrepit, and it just doesn't look good. Uh, so I too would be in favor of maybe doing a, you know, finding, working with Old Town Cape and and the merchants there to come up with some other plan to have something that would still identify the pedestrian crosswalks, uh, and keep our traffic slow like it is. We had a comment from the crowd. Can we take one? Thank you. It's just me. Um, my name is Kellison Hines, and I am overcome. Whew, brother, that's some strong stuff. <laughs> um, my name is Kellison Hines, and I live at 233 North Lormer. And we've lived downtown for 125 million years, and we love it. And we love all the improvements that have come in the last 15 years. I mean, when you talked about downtown being beautiful, that's one of the main things we like. When those signs went up, I about had a heart attack because they are straight up ugly. They are unattractive. And they were a big surprise. You know, unless, I guess unless you come to city council on the regular, we had no idea that these things were gonna grow up out of the middle of the street. Um, they, and this, this sounds very petty, but they ruin every picture you try to take downtown. My husband works for a beer distributor. They make trying to navigate anything. The lawn mowing companies that are going back and forth, trying to drag a trailer to go up Broadway to mow all the properties downtown. Um, they've made things very difficult and they're ugly. I know I've, I may have mentioned that before. They are hideous. And they were bad enough when they were new, but after they've been beat up and run over and beat up and run over, they just, they're awful. And then God love the people that don't understand that they're yield signs that stop and stop and stop at every single one, even if there's nobody there. I would really, really support you all talking to some downtown people, not just the, the local businesses, but there's plenty of people like me that live downtown that just don't like them. Most people cross wherever they're going to find a spot to cross anyway. I understand up by Annie Laurie's when they're crisscrossing right there between those three little businesses, it can be kind of busy, but that's not always the norm. Um, but if you all would include, somehow include the, the residents that live downtown to get some input on if you are dead set to have to have paddles in the middle of the street, find something a little less glaringly hideous. That's 
That's what we're trying to get away. That from. would be awesome. I would really like to see them go away and just put signs on the sides like civilized places have that don't have to put these things up. But that's that's my goal. So. That'd be great. Because most of the folks that, that I've talked to are not fans that live there. So, thank you. There is uh, one other thing that, that Molly did uh, bring up with us, and that is uh, two or three of the signs down, two down now, I think, and then three down uh, for 10 weeks. I can't see spending money and having staff put more signs back up if we're not going to put them back up later. So I would say that'd be a wasted expense. Stacy? Well, for, for me, though, the question that came up was, um, you know, is there data that shows that really shows that there's been a decrease in the number of signs that are needed? Um, we need to hear over three studies that before and after Maybe not slowing down speed, but you know, creating talking to people to stop in the street, and also having vehicles hit. I mean, cars are hitting them, but um, well, so I could that's, look at this data and say that it has slowed down. Well, I, I mean, if you look at a report, yeah. it actually, if you look at an average, if you look at the 85th percentile, they have dropped. Now, some of it is very minute, but they have dropped. But they really weren't speeding before, too much. No, not too much. I mean, they, the thing was before that cars were speeding by all the time. and. But it wasn't also about that. It was also about the safety of the right. pedestrians. I know. I know. Well, I'm just, yep. I'm just saying there's no data. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not glaring data, and there's no correlation between accidents and the signs, so uh, I agree. Yeah, I mean, it, it just seems like there may be a, there may be a spot or two perhaps that need a permanent sign or something that's pedestrian, you know, push a button to get a signal or something. And that's, and that's I think, what, you're, what we want to consider. But um, I, I am concerned about the fact that they're getting hit, which means that cars are hitting them, and that's right. perhaps causing the damage to cars, perhaps more damage than we've seen previously. Okay. How much of it's on purpose? <laughs> I'm directing that towards John Maynard. <laughs> okay, well, I think staff's got the general idea, so uh, we can move on. So, do you? So, is it the? It's the idea of, ca of council that they, we would replace the ones that are down or not. No. The idea of council is that we let them naturally, um, if we lose any more between now and the time we would take them out, then we'll just, they'll, they'll, we will not replace them. And, and then this fall, we'll just reconsider the whole concept with the help of Old Town Cape and the CID board. That's a consensus. I'm just for you all. I guess my whole question with the thing, with everything is, it is a, a concern, a safety concern that was brought up by the businesses um, who are down there every day, all day. They have hundreds of customers come in and an increasing pedestrian traffic. And I'm thankful the fact that we're now, we're not just abandoning it because what a liability do we assume then as a city then if the safety concern was brought to us and then we write it off and then God forbid a pedestrian does get hit and there's not a sign there anymore. And so acknowledge it and put something up that it makes it more recognizable that there's a crosswalk there it makes it safer for pedestrians i think we all i speak for everyone when we can only hope that we increase the pedestrian traffic down there with the success of our businesses that are downtown so we only hope that there's more pedestrian traffic and with that a safer means with which to cross back and forth to the various shops and restaurants and etc as we go down there um, so i think having something there would be good um, and i i just i it, to have a concern brought to us and then to negate it, I think that doesn't that doesn't suit us I don't well. Think we're talking about negate it. We're just doing it yeah. I know. I'm saying yeah. yeah. Well, but at that point, there are accidents all the time. Everybody's neighborhood is going to have accidents. So to me, a bigger question is how do we determine? 
when a, it's an area that's truly a problem. Well, we do studies, and it seems like we've been told there really isn't a huge glaring problem. But that's, I'm concerned about the present. What Nate's trying to say is if we're going to bring more pedestrians downtown, then we need to establish some type of safety area, whether it's to paint the street to identify that it's a crosswalk, because there, it's not painted. So you, it's not clear. I mean, you, you can drive down there in the middle of the night, you don't even know that that's where you're supposed to walk. So, so I think what Nate's trying to say is that if we're going to bring more people downtown to Cape, then we need something that's clear, that's visible for safety reasons, not necessarily abandoning what we're doing, but just have something in place, which I guess doesn't have to be decided right now, but I think that's what you're trying that's to say. Exactly right. I think the paddle signs were the start. You know, the, the middle of the middle of the street paddle signs kind of got us started because we had heard the, the, the business owner, you know, concerns. And so those paddle signs have gotten us started, but now we can engage in a deeper conversation. I always think back, it was a couple of months ago, a young lady came and presented to us uh, with visual impairments about downtown Cape with visual impairments. And I always think, how can we better adapt for all citizens? How do we, how do we make this a better place to shop downtown? Because the goal is, let's get more retail down there, let's get more restaurants, let's get more people down in downtown Cape. And so now with Old Town Cape Engage, this has been a project that has brought a lot of community conversation about. And so I think we all like the concept, but now it's really time to refine the concept and, and get some good ideas from Old Town Cape and CID and really see where we can take this in a more permanent way that's not going to get hit every 35 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's frustrating. And believe me, I get frustrated when people slow down or stop at each one. I've also been down there, thanks to COVID, taking lots of family walks downtown. And I have a four-year-old who may or may not see a squirrel in the middle as he's trying to cross the road. And I'm thankful that those cars are slowing down as they're approaching so that I'm able to safely walk and they're not just zooming down they have some sort of visual reference that there is a crosswalk coming up with people crossing okay well thank you for that uh yeah we will then allow them to we will not be replacing any of them uh when fall comes if there's any left we'll take them down and then we'll engage in a uh, a discussion about that obviously pedestrians were a big part of the original design you know that's the reason that the the crosswalks are concrete and the rest of it's is asphalt is to make that differentiation uh that's the reason they have the bubbles out i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of good design that went into that and so how can we enhance that and then so that's what we'll be looking to try to do we'll bring that back to you thank you uh anybody here tonight uh, to appear before the council for an item not on the agenda hello Ramona. <laughs> so my question, I'm concerned about the planning and zoning uh, meeting that was recorded and the conversation that was going on. Um, kind of wondering what's being done about that. I don't know that at this point nothing's being done about that. Nothing? <laughs> So I would like something to be done about that. I mean, I have lots of people. And so I believe what we need is a hearing. If these people are not willing to resign on their own, uh, have these people, were they appointed by the council? People were appointed by the council. The people were appointed by the council. Um, so were their names just pulled out of a hat or were they vote? So you specifically that they apply for that, that commission just like any other advisory board except that commission does entail a little bit of expertise in uh, sometimes it may be building sometimes it may be okay well my main concern is why is nothing being done about it because that was clear clear racism at its finest and uh, you got that's not acceptable for me and a lot of people. And so why is nothing being done about it? Okay, I will answer your question if you'll let me answer it. The remarks made at that meeting were about a movement called Black Lives Matter. Is that not correct? Are you asking me questions now? Or are you telling me why nothing's being done? I asked you a question. <laughs> Did you hear the conversation? I hear the conversation. 
Okay, so I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to answer questions. I need to know why nothing's being done. Okay, remarks about a political movement, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's some other movement, whether it's about the Democrats or about the Republicans, are not are not necessarily. Well, when our it's kids just, are being no, murdered, you don't have the floor, man. Would you please well, sit down? Come on now. You can come after me. I'll come after you. Those comments were personal opinion. Everybody in this country has a right to express their personal opinion. That's right. But when I they hold political, when they I hold mean, offices, I when they, I'm, I, I got this, when they hold offices that hold people like there, that they are responsible for people that they don't like, and so they make decisions based off of their prejudices, that's, that's racist, and they should not be in position of authority like that. If they want to be racist, they can be racist wherever they want to be, but not in positions of power in political offices that people of color have to be under whatever choices they decide. That's right. Making a comment about some political movement in our country is anybody's right. But when they say it started at the zoo, what does that mean? Right. I didn't hear all the, I didn't You didn't hear, hear that? Did anybody else hear him say it started at the zoo? Yeah. Okay, so what does that mean when he say it started at the zoo? Hit where? Yeah, no, no we didn't. He said it started at Mizzou. No, okay, I didn't think so. So why is nothing being done about it? At this point, I understand that the, the gentlemen have apologized for their comments. They were made personally to each other before the meeting started. There was not any many meeting going on I know they didn't know they didn't know they were getting recorded they re, they were sorry they got recorded but they were not sorry for their statement so anybody in a position of authority or in a position like that should not be in that position when they hold prejudice against people who are they are making decisions for and if Mr. Patrick, I, forget, I don't know if he's still here or not, but he came out on Facebook with his comments that he doesn't support this and all of that. So something wasn't right about him. He was the uh, presiding over that meeting at that time. So if he's going to come out and make an apology and all of this and it wasn't right and this and that and the other, then something's not right about that. And if you guys are sitting here condoning how they handle that and you're not going to do nothing about it, you just exposing yourselves too. You're exposing yourself to. Now, I would like to know, I know some of you all are new, like Nate, but who all voted for those people to be on that board? Nobody? Or whoever? No, so all, nobody did? No, none of the people. Robbie did, we know that. Anybody else? Huh? You would have to find out when they were brought on board. Stacy, do you? I couldn't really hear. Yo, you. So just Robbie and you, y'all, there's only two people that appointed them? I don't know when they were appointed and when they were reappointed. We'd have to do some research on that. So how long have they been in these positions? Well, one of them has been on, that, on P and Z for a number of years. So is that why nothing's really been done with the south part of Cape? Because these people don't want things to happen on the south part of Cape? That has nothing to do with why things are not done in the south part. Well, I would like for him to explain why things are not happening on the south end of Cape. Man, because that's, that's part of the planning and zoning community. They, they should have a lot to do with that. We've heard a lot of stuff that's happening. That's a whole other area of comment. Oh, I need to. Well, I'm here. I'm trying to understand because the way you guys saying those guys were just as fine. Whatever they could say, they should have a right to say whatever they want to, but not in those positions. Not in those positions. All sorts of development going on in the city, mm -hmm. whether it's the south side, whether it's the west side, whether it's the north side. Mm -hmm. Ain't no development on the south side. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and let yield. So we've already got y'all's answers down. Um, anybody else want to go ahead and take? Thank you, Ms. Patterson. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Geneva Allen Patterson. I live at 510 Olive Street here in Cape Girada. And I'm piggybacking on Mona. It says in Luke 8, 17, for nothing is hidden that will be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. It says in Luke 12, 3, therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. This is what happened there. This hot mic that was part of this Wednesday Cape Girada planning and zoning meeting reveal what people actually felt about Black Lives Matter because what you say or think you're saying in the dark will come to the light. And that's what happens. So what Mona is asking, what I'm asking, that Martin Luther King indicated that the evils of racism will endanger any further gains for the black American community. And this has already happened too much to us. So this type of racism, we're not going to tolerate. This is supposed to be one city. One city means that we're uniting, uniting our city as one. We can't do it with this type of racism in the city. So what we're calling for, we're calling for a hearing by the city council on these commissioners, and we're asking for the removal of them. Thank you. Any other comments? Hi, my name is Jamika Robinson. I'm uh, Madison Robinson's mom. I don't know if you guys have heard, but she was my daughter. She was murdered August 24th um, of last year. She was 15 years old, nine days shy of her 16th birthday. I came here personally to speak to you, Mr. Fox, because I've seen that you've been very vocal about the uh, removal of a statue, but yet there's been murder after murder, crime after crime on the south side of Cape Girardeau, and you have not spoken out about it. And as a mayor of this city, I would think when these type of crimes are committed, you want to know why, how, that we can all come together and fix it. I want to know why you haven't set up a meeting between maybe your panel and our panel so that we can get together and discuss how to stop these crimes. Y'all sit up here on this board and live y'all little plush life, but we're out here fighting every day to live. Y'all, some of y'all gonna have to come from behind y'all desk come up out your offices and come up out right. in these streets with us yeah. and see what's going on. You cannot hold no position and ignore a certain part of town or ignore certain people. Yeah. Well, I'm asking you and the rest of you guys, I studied, uh, studied y'all today, to, 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 hey, come out here with us. Come and see this community and see what's going on. How can a child be murdered in your, in your, in your city and you haven't spoken out about it? Or you haven't came and spoke to the community about it. I'm sure all of you have children. I'm sure if your child was murdered, you want to know, you want to, you want answers. You want somebody convicted of her murder. Yeah. I've been yeah. ignored too long, and I'm not going to be ignored anymore. Yeah. If I got to come up here every week, if I got to, if I got to come protest at your house, right. from this point on, I'm committing it to my child because yeah. she deserved justice. Yeah. And that's all I got to say. I don't live over here, but I stand behind these ladies that are, their children are getting murdered and nobody cares. I mean, it's racism at its finest and I'm white. A little white boy gets punched in. I mean, we've gained $16,000 as a community. Yamika got a letter after doing a fundraiser. Well, she can't even have a fundraiser in this community right. for her daughter? Well, we can raise 16000 for somebody that got punched. It is not acceptable. It's not at all. And for you to not even reach out to her as a mother, you're the mayor of Cape. I mean, what's up with that? That's not cool on any level. Nobody 
cares that you all are treating a flippin' witness? Nah, she's not a witness. She is a suspect. Let's try acting like it is and treat this crime what it is. It was a murder of a child. And if it was your child, you would fight. If it was my child, I'd be up here every day and I would be at everybody's house, including yes. prosecutors yes. and everybody, because ain't nobody better than the other. We all bleed red and we all God's children. So something in this town needs to change yes. and it needs to change now. Yes. And that's yes. all I got to yes. yes. I'm Leslie Washington. I live at 315 North Frederick, and I stand behind this young lady and her family. Regardless, gun violence needs to stop. It's too much happening. Too many children are being lost. Too many parents burying their children, and that shouldn't be the case. And you as a mayor, you need to do something better because this needs to stop, bottom line, and that's all. on North Henderson. 2012, yes. a lady moved in, purchased a house on our street. I'm sorry, I'm Katie Rivas. I'm Amy Hodges. From 2014 to every single day last week and this week, we have had gunshots, we have fighting, we have children, we have damage, we have vandalism. We all hear it. We're all reporting it. We are told report, report, report. We're reporting it. We called three times in a matter of a few minutes from each other. Kate PD comes by and nothing is done. Right. Uh, we are being told, and I, I've spoken with Nate many times. I've spoken with Officer Couch. There's a small rumbling of things. The problem is, is there has to be more that can be done because the second Kate PD shows up, these people disappear and nothing. Officers leave and nothing is done. We have it on video. We have a neighbor that was actually told, have you thought about moving? Wow. You can't do that if you're just, you, I mean, everything you have is tied to a house. And some of us have, I've had my home for 18 years. I've been there 11. 11. You know, within 36 hours, the man yeah. in the alley had been shot in the leg. Yeah. Another shooting with, within 12 hours later at the bottom of my driveway. Two houses down 12, 14 hours later, yep. they had Another shot directly shooting. at the house. There's two houses away. And with children in this home. <laughs> Small children. D toddlers and diapers. We have also another property that this individual owns that is condemned. There's a big red sign on the door. People are sneaking in and out of the back of the building. What, what, what do you do with that? They're causing crime. They're bringing drugs. You're watching them. I watched a deal happen in the middle of the street. I have it on video. But again, hands are being tied is what we're being told because there's, there's nothing that, that they can do. We report, we report, we report. For what? We are doing all the legwork while these people act like they're the victims. Thus, the KFBS 12 story that was done on our behalf, requested by me from a friend of mine. He's like, let's do it. Let's get it out there. Unfortunately, there were some miscommunications and the video did have to get removed because individuals information was given out there, which wasn't long story short. It just it, there has to be something done. You know, I can't go inside my house if I want to, because who is going to live down the street from this crap storm that is showing up? This woman is in jail every what, two, three months because of a nuisance abatement. She's not handling it. She's hiding in her house. She acted like I spoke with an officer today. She acts like she has no idea what's going on in these houses. Okay, you've lived there since 2014. It's not our first rodeo. We've been dealing with this on a regular basis. Not only, up in, I guess I should say, up until, what, a year ago? It was mainly just traffic. Traffic, 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 traffic. A year ago, it started with the shooting over an air conditioning unit. 
One of the houses was actually burned less than 30 days from her purchasing the house. They were running extension cords across the street. Still living in it. We were told, document this. Well, how am I, you can't document it because the second they know anything is coming and anything is going to be documented, they, they scatter. scatter. I don't know if they have a scanner in their house. We've tried calling the non-emergency number. We tried calling the emergency number. I've tried to email people. Hey, this is what's going on. Trying to get a quicker, sneaky response. I don't know how else to word that, but a sneaky way to into the back side of this. They acted like they were the victims. Literally, they are the ones that are fighting with neighbors across the street. The officers had literally driven away, driven away the other day within 10 minutes. There was fighting and glass breaking and all of this. The officers were barely off the block. And we have to call them back again. How many times do we have to report before something is done? Before somebody else is murdered, is shot, is injured, one of our kids, any of the kids. There's people in the alley, people, I mean, there's, it's all residential. This woman needs to be out of our neighborhood. She needs to not be allowed to buy residential properties in the city of Cape because she owns four properties, five with the one that's burned down. And all we are dealing with is more and more crime from this particular scenario. I understand it's being yeah. worked on. I understand that. But that's uh, kind of where we've kind of been getting. I, 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 I wish I could say we go in right away and just stop it. But it doesn't work that way. Yeah. The laws don't work that way. Our hands have been tied a lot by legislators who pass laws that say there's a lot of things we cannot do anymore and until that changes it's a slow process and i wish it i wish it could be much quicker uh where our addresses are we're at she's, yeah she's at 16. I'm at she 12. owns 16 38 37 and 33 is the one that burned down there is a property it's town and country it was a town and country reality building that that's on independence. independence also is hers is yeah. it 1580? I know it's 15 something. It's right there, kind of right across from the U Haul shop. That's the one that's condemned. But you, we have it on good report. You condemn a property. There's a certain legal process you have to no, go through. No, I totally understand. And we're working but on that. We, we have on good authority people who live in that area that the people are sneaking in and out of the back of the building. There's, There's no there. utilities. There's no. This is in the works to completely remove those properties from being Her able to be rented and lived in. So. Yeah, because there's four of us that are in a group chat, a chat, and the second anything happens, we're all communicating. But the problem is, is we are all stuck because you can't, you right. can't do anything. Well, no one's gonna go. come in and buy it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're just worried about the escalation. Obviously, I mean, it's not just about the property values. It is. To an extent. Yeah, and nobody but, wants to be woke up at four in the morning with gunshots at the bottom of your driveway and scared for your life and your neighbors and yeah. the kids and everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> We'll do.
we, we have, and we're both in, you know, Holly's in, involved at the international level, I'm involved at the state level, uh, asking these questions to other city managers, other cities, um, because of the changes in the state law, it, it has become very, very difficult. It's not unique to, to Cape Girardeau, right. I'll guarantee you. We, we, it's everywhere in the state. That, that actually, where chronic nuisance came from was from those reaching out, and that's been a tool that has helped. And that is something we were told was was actually delivered to the owner. Yes. yes. She just doesn't she seem has to 10 days, care. I think, I think 15, 15 days, days is what we were told. Days. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Patrol. Did you request extra patrol on your street? Well, we uh, there's going to be actually today. I think one of them might have done damage to my property too. I noticed my fence had an enormous rock thrown through it. My privacy fence today. So they're actually patrolling the street and the alley now. Alley yes. Yeah. Between Hanover yeah. and Henderson. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, guys. It. Don't, please don't fall. Please don't fall. Don't do that they gonna do something about that. Yeah. They won't sleep. They won't rest until. Anybody else? Oh, you make it right in your face if you have anything to say to too. Hello. Um, my name is Andy Layton. I live at 3922 Valley View in Cape Girardeau, Ward 6. Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council, I appreciate having a couple of minutes of your time. I did prepare a statement, which takes about two minutes uh, to read, um, and it's about the CSA monument. I wanted to tag on to a conversation, a discussion that was previously had about comments that are made up here. And while you were speaking, Mr. Mayor, and it is your job to defend people's right to freedom of speech. That is true. But I wanted to call your attention to what is behind you. The United States flag, the flag of Missouri, the seal of the great state of Missouri, and our fair city. When people sit up here and they have off-the-cuff conversations, they are sitting in front of these symbols. So if there is a hearing, or if there's anything to be said to those members who may be regretting the conversation that they had, maybe that's something that all members of all commissions should be enlightened to, is that they are standing in front of those symbols that are representative of all of us. People do have their differing political views. Some of them are more informed than others. Some of them are very badly informed, but they are entitled to them nonetheless. They just need to be reminded of where they're sitting. The reason that I came here tonight was to address you on the issue of the CSA monument and it's kind of a different perspective. Five years ago, we served as a host family for a foreign exchange student from Germany attending Southeast Missouri State University. One of the young lady's first questions when she arrived at our home was, were we still mad at Germany over World War II? We kind of laughed a little bit. We assured her that we certainly did not hold any grudges against her. Even her parents were not born yet in the 1940s. In our minds, we understood that her grandparents most likely were involved in the German war effort whether they wanted to be or not. They might have been willing Nazis, but we did not engage in that discussion. Frankly, we did not want to know. Instead, we told her that today, in fact, we were glad to know that Germany is a strong leader and ally in the European Union. The post-war relationship between once wartime rivals was only possible because the symbols of the Nazi regime and its leaders were destroyed. Memories of the war and the beloved fallen have been relegated to history books, historic battlefields, cemeteries, and museums. 
they're not part of the public square or honored anywhere other than in those types of places. The inscription on the fountain at Ivers Square from 1911, how enlightened they were. It reads that it was erected in the memory of all fallen soldiers during the Civil War. Then and now, these magnanimous words are the best it can ever get for the descendants of traitors to the nation who fought to keep others enslaved, owned persons to whom the owners could do whatever they wanted and did. And then after the war, they set out for now 155 years to repress the descendants of those slaves in various ways, legally, not legally, unfortunately, parts of state and federal laws that to this day we are still fighting against. Be assured, there will be no peaceful resting place found for the CSA monument if the decision of its future does not involve significant input from members of the African-American community and other minority groups whose lives have been diminished through the terroristic use of the symbols of the Confederacy of which that CSA monument is a part. Thank you for your time this evening. Anybody else? If not, we'll move into agenda. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Go ahead. My name is Lariah Cooper. I stay on 409 Sheridan Drive. My name is Willie Washington, and I stay on 724 North Themis. I want to talk about the gun violence because it's really getting out of hand. Um, Maddie, she was 15, murdered on her own porch. Last night, Anthony Miller was shot inside of his own house, later died in the hospital. Last night, a couple houses down from mine. And I say the reason all these murders is going on and everybody steady murdering and killing and stuff because y'all making them think it's okay. Y'all not solving nobody cases, so they're going to be like, oh, well, they not going to solve them, so we just going to do them. It's not going to be no justice. Yeah. They not going to find out who did them. Y'all have to do y'all job. If y'all not doing y'all job, it's going to steady continue to happen and happen and happen. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be scared for our life when we leave the house. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have to walk around watching our back everywhere we go. It's really getting out of hand. Then we get pulled over. Not only do we have to worry about our own color shooting us down, but then we have to worry about if the police going to shoot us down. I watched my own brother get put at gunpoint for getting pulled over. If it wasn't for me, he would have shot my brother right there. I was running up to the police officer to please don't shoot my brother. Please don't shoot my brother. All because his brakes was messed up and it was raining outside. And the police officer thought he was trying to run away, but he just trying to stop his car. He just get out the car and put them at gunpoint. It's not okay. If y'all not going to do y'all job, y'all need to send task force down here. Y'all need to send some bigger people down here that will do our, that will do y'all job. It's not fair. We shouldn't have to, none of it. I want y'all to look at that. Look how pretty she is. Look how young she was and full of life she was. Y'all see this right here? I've had this for almost 11 months now. I've lived with the same pain for almost 11 months now. Every other day, every other month, is somebody else getting killed. With every other month that goes by, there's still no resolution, nobody locked up for anything or held accountable for any actions that go on around here. We are teenagers. Y'all have to understand this. If this wasn't an eye opener for anybody else, this should have been an eye opener for the teenagers that live here. This was a peaceful person. 
she was not a fighter at all. Instead of us getting to see her turn 16, get her first job, go to her first prom, any of that, now instead, on her birthday, I have to go to a graveyard to see her. And is that cool? I don't is, understand. Is if it was your okay? kids, it'd be different. Tell me what I answer. If it was your kids, y'all would want to judge. None of that's okay. None of it's okay. And I wish, you know, I wish we could solve more murders. I wish we could solve more crimes. But you've got to have help to solve crimes. It's not like it's not like it's not like the police are not investigating it. I empathize. I empathize. But let me speak on your help. I empathize. Cape Girardeau Police Department had help. They had statements signed from people who was actually in the car when my daughter was murdered. Okay, but what did they do? They sit there and they ask those people that was involved in my daughter's murder to make a statement, to entrust them with making a statement. Then they turned around two days later and blasted them all over the media. They, the whole entire statement, word for word, verbatim. So how can you sit up and say help when the help was offered? And then the police turned around and betrayed that help. So the police cannot sit up here and ask us to speak up and speak out of what we do. They blast us all over Southeast Missouri or all over KSVS 12. Now the whole world know that I told. How does that work? What, what more help do you want? What do y'all need? Y'all have the guns that was using my daughter's murder. Y'all had a shot that the guy had on that night. That night when he killed my child. Y'all have that. Y'all have witness statements. What more do y'all want? I'm trying to understand this whole community. What do they want? Y'all want me to go get a gun and shoot his ass back? Then they'll arrest you. No, that's the truth. Because I'm sick of this shit. Y'all sitting up here behind this, 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 this walls, pretending, shaking your head. Yeah, this is my fucking pain every day. My daughter is murdered. Get your ass from behind them seats. Get up out them seats and come out here and see what's going on in y'all community. Why are you comfortable sitting up here knowing kids are being murdered in your community? You haven't shown not one sign of emotion. Right. Not one. I haven't seen from any of y'all up here. Nothing. They only cared about the boy punch. Yeah. It was, that was, the whole community was outraged about that. Y'all was outraged about a little boy being punched, but not my daughter being murdered. You know why? Because she's black and he's white. And we're going to call it like it is. That's what we're going to call it. It's racial injustice, period. Y'all treat crimes differently depending on our skin color. Because had Maddie been a 15-year-old little white girl, we wouldn't even be here. Come on. Don't sit up. You go speak to your officers that was there that night or the officers that took that statement. And ask them why did they release Khalees Twig's statement. Ask them that. Because I think it was done intentionally. I have never seen a witness statement released in the newspaper. Never. Never. Y'all, they treated my daughter case like they was fucking Charlie Brown. Now watch your language, please. And you, you, if you come from out there, you come out here and you see what I got to go through. You don't tell me to watch my mouth about my child that was murdered. You show some compassion. Get up off your behind and come on out here. Your, this your community. This ain't this my, I'm not responsible for this community. You are. All of y'all are. First thing I want to know about is um, progress on the crosswalk by Arena Park. We talked about that several months ago and was going before the highway patrol, I mean the, high, the, the highway department. So is there any progress being made on that crosswalk that will help people cross Kings Highway 
at that intersection where there's foot traffic while people are trying to get to where meals are and to the other side of town. Do we have any updates on that? No. I know they were looking at it, but I, I have not heard, but we will check on that. Not, have you heard anything? Uh, no, we haven't heard anything back from MoDOT, so we'll, but we will, we will check on that. <coughs> Thanks for the reminder. Uh, I have four things, so on to two. <clears throat> there are a lot of models for how to address community violence. Cape Girardeau is listed by the FBI as the ninth most murderous city in Missouri. That's troubling yes, it is. hot spot policing is one strategy i am not a big send the police out person over policing and proper policing are different over policing is when people who don't need to be policed are being over policed neighborhoods like the lady spoke of on independence, if it takes having an officer stationed on that street until they remove themselves, the resources need to be invested into our community to make sure that what needs to happen happens. That's what hot spot policing is. It's when you identify a key trouble area and you saturate that area with policing until the problem dissipates. I have not spoken to Chief Blair about this specifically. I can only imagine budget constraints, but I don't accept that. We find money to do whatever we want to do. When technology malfunctioned, we found the money. Our people are more of a priority than anything else. We don't have a city without people. The people are the city. And that's where our money has to go before swimming pools, before splash parks. I don't care where the money comes from. If we have to pull it from every department until we figure this out, we have to figure this out and we have to stop talking about how we're going to figure it out. I sit in meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting listening to y'all talk about how we're going to talk about it. We've got to stop talking about talking about it and do it because children are dying and people are living in terror. <clears throat> Where I work, there was a shootout on my property. I was so discombobulated, I could not function. I could not think. I had nightmares. I was nauseous, and that was one day that I sat where there was shooting around me. I cannot imagine having to live where there are gunfire after gunfire after gunfire, not knowing is it coming through your windows. Children four and five years old on Good Hope know that they need to duck when they hear we are better than this. We are better than this as a city. And when we do not invest our resources, our people do not hear care. All we care about you is moot when that care is not action. The scripture says love not only in word, but in word and deed. 
And if that love is not loud enough for the one who is most removed from love to hear it, love is for our own sake, not for the sake of the ones we say we love. We got to do better. <sighs> Point three. The Planning and Zoning Commission and the responses that were made here tonight are all unacceptable. It is offensive for the statement to be made and for us to be expected to accept that whatever is said on that side of the bench is off the record. When any one person who is elected or appointed to a position is sitting in the seat of that position, they are automatically representing that position where the ding has done, whether the mic is on, whether the camera is rolling or not. And y'all know that, you're professionals. You know from the minute you put your badge on to go into your office place that you're representing your company. You know that. You are professional people. And we must hold our professionals to higher standards. We have a whole community of people who do not believe that y'all care about them and y'all represent the power structure and everything that impacts their lives from their housing to their education to their streets. And when you allow statements to be made and just, well, it was just political. We can, no, we can't talk about Democrats. We can't talk about Republicans. We can't talk about Black Lives Matter. We can't talk about nothing but planning and zoning during the planning and zoning meeting. Now, y'all know that. You know it. And so for people, person after person, to even have to come and tell you that this needs to be addressed is a shame. A hearing needs to be called. Now, maybe the findings of your hearing are that, you know, we need to do some disciplinary action or some corrective action. But to not even dignify the humanity of people who are not just offended with their ears, but offended with their souls. When Mona says, y'all showing yourselves, that's exactly what she means. The scripture in Matthew 12, 34 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You're not going to say something out loud that isn't already festering in your heart. A hearing needs to be called. Proper procedure needs to be followed. And if offending the hum human dignity of the people you are elected to serve is not cause for calling a hearing, not near one of you need to be sitting up there. Last. When the people call you to come out, you need to be where they are. You may not have a context for what that looks like. Shelley Moore was the only council person at the Black Lives Matter protest on May 31st. That's where the people are. When the people gather on the corner, y'all should gather with them with us. When Felice calls the community to prayer on the corner, gather. See what happens in that space, relationship is built. In that space, that's where the meetings happen. In that space, that's when ideas are expressed, when pain, when grief. We don't need a city council that feels sorry for people, 
We need a city council that grieves with people. And when you feel the grief that others are bearing, you will respond and act in ways that even surprise you. Be with your people. Just like you don't have a trouble showing up at the golf club, show up on the basketball court. Yes, they may look at you strange. They should be suspicious of why you're there. But keep showing up. It is in your persistence and your willingness to be uncomfortable and your humility that you will win the hearts of people. And if you don't win the heart of this community, you are not fulfilling your role as a council person. You're not leading anyone. You might be making decisions that people have to uh, abide by, but you are not leaders. And people are looking for leadership. And you should be who they trust, and they don't trust you. Because you have been convicted by your own words. And only you can turn this thing around. And instead of circling the wagons and protecting each other, we need to just call this crap out. When we see it, we say it. And start holding each other accountable. Because this, people are hurting. They are deeply hurting. And you know what happens when people hurt like this? They implode or they explode. And for centuries, people have been imploding. They're about to explode. And you, you have your fingers on the pressure point. You're going to decide what happens in this town. You, you, you decide who you want to be in this moment. And not what the people who look like you are going to say about you. Because we are always going to have our own personal fan clubs. But what are the people who don't look like you, who don't live where you live, who don't walk your walk of life, who are they going to say you are? When the person with the least amount of affluence and influence is the one who feels most honored by you, then you've done something. And that's your challenge. You decide who you want to be. This community is hurting. And I hope that you will make a decision to be agents of healing and stop doubling down on that which causes pain. You need the anti-racist training. I listen to you talk. You don't know what you're saying. You don't understand how hurtful you are. You have talked amongst yourselves for so long that your language is common. That hearing commissioners say what they said is common, normal, acceptable. It is not. You need sensitivity training. You need to understand why it is you're hurtful. You need to understand the harm you're doing. And if you're not willing to understand, then you'll never be able to authentically love. Anybody else? We can. Uh, I would like to know in from from the city and from the uh, city attorney. Uh, in in regard to that, what what can be done from the city state? 
it's find a witness that will testify. What? Find a witness that will testify. No, no, I don't. I don't know. For one thing, that's the prosecuting attorney's office. It's not a police I'm, issue. I'm not going to make a comment about something that I am not. Well, I just wanted to know from you know, like what what can be the... from a city council position from anybody in this room. There's nothing to be done. It is now resting in the hands of the prosecuting attorney who has to file charges against those people who they already know are guilty of the crime. Right. Okay. Now, because the witness said they won't testify, the prosecutor has said that they're not going to prosecute. A prosecutor can file charges against someone without a witness's testimony. They have the statement. They could subpoena her. They could offer her protection. They have done nothing of that sort. So it all lies on the, prosecutor, the prosecuting attorney's um, angle at this point. And so what you could do, the only thing you could do is very much from an unofficial capacity, is use your space of influence to press for that charge to be made and not allow your personal relationship with an individual to cloud your uh, persistence for the charges to be brought. Yeah. Okay. And to be clear, our police did not, did not put the, put the information out in that space. Correct, Chief? That's correct. We never released any documents on any ongoing investigation whatsoever. Never. So no idea how, they, how it got to the newspaper? It was in the probable cause statement. It was in the probable cause statement that the newspaper, my understanding, is got from the court. We have to send probable cause statements to the prosecutor's office to the reporter. You never get a warrant. You have to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't have a choice or nobody will ever get arrested. That's the, me that's the document that a judge signs off on to make an arrest. Mm -hmm. As far as public release of documents, we never release a document on an active ongoing case. Never have since I've been here, never will. So the process has been changed and that's how we know that people know that they were negligent. Mm -hmm. The prosecutor's office is now receiving those uh, probable cause statements prior to, and they're redacting what needs to be redacted. The Maddie's uh, witness statement, Kalisa's witness statement was never redacted. So the entire thing, when uh, the reporter was sent to the court to pick it up, they picked it up verbatim, nothing redacted. The newspaper has also changed their policy in terms of what information they're printing. Part of the issue is nobody is willing to be held accountable. And to continue to say, oh, well, oops, we did it wrong, so now we fixed it, so everything is okay, while Maddie's murder is still walking free. And people are still terrified. To, so all of, the, all of the work that was done to try to build trust, establishing an anonymous tip line, which people don't trust, whenever this is released. So this is how you need to see the, the unfolding impact and how... This has set up the community back in terms of progress. And what do you do? You can only try to right the wrong, and the wrong was that Maddie's murderer is still walking free. Here in Kate. I wish that wasn't the case, but as a council, we can't do anything legally about no, that not whatsoever. As, a council, as an individual, you can call Mark Welker. I know how these calls are made. Y'all can well, call. I also, I also know that a prosecutor will not prosecute a case if he doesn't think they can get a conviction. And it's a waste of taxpayers' money to spend all the time prosecuting a case if you don't get a conviction, excuse me, if you don't have a witness. So that's that's a conundrum. But it was worth it when that boy got slapped downtown to get people to get that guy who slapped him. That was important, right? Well, any crime, and that's the any kind of thing important. that you have to be aware of, is when you have these two types of things juxtaposed to each other, and, you, and, and you're telling one set of people that mad, and, and I know you're not saying this, but you're saying this, Maddie's life isn't worth tax dare payer dollars. That, and that's what's, that's what's heard. And that's what causes and, and, and creates more streams of pain. <clears throat> Whenever we're willing to go to the ropes to find
find one person's assailant, but this person isn't worth taxpayer dollars. I'm just, I'm just telling you what I've been told by the prosecutor, because I've asked. So even after everything you've heard tonight and everything that you've seen and you still feel that way? You feel like well, his hands I are tied. wish there were a way I wish there were a way I could change that. And I wish I could I wish I could reach out and comfort the mother so you losing a like child. If, I've know, lost a child. I know what it feel feels like, like to you lose made a, a child. Call to the prosecuting attorney and say, Hey, we need to look at this thing another way. If you called him and said, not just not as the mayor, as Bob, Bob to Mark, hey, look, we had a city council meeting last night and some things were open to my eyes and I think you need to relook at this. Call a special prosecutor. The, the assistant prosecutor who is on Maddie's case is the same prosecutor that put Maddie's cousin in jail, in prison. Well, so uh, now here's like, the family not, is thinking. We're, we can't, not we can't spend all night talking about something that's without, the council cannot do anything about. So let's move on, please. Anything else? Well, you can do something about the planning and zoning. That discussion will that discussion will happen. Agenda review. Tonight we have one public hearing. It'll be for the annexation of 4072 State Highway K. Um, this is our only public hearing tonight. Under the consent agenda, we have uh, the second and third readings of um, <coughs> plan of changing of zoning for 920 North Middle Street from R2 to RUMD, of 900 South Kings Highway from M2 to M1, um, <clears throat> uh, north side of LaSalle and Baldwin uh, from C2 to R1. And then we have uh, the amending of chapter 26. This is regarding speed limits to match um, some of MoDOT's practices, uh, the second and third reading of that. And then we have the permanent utility easement for the Liberty Apartments at, uh, on Walnut Street, uh, the second and third reading of that. And then we have uh, the repealing of ordinance number 5076. Uh, this is uh, easements on, on unimproved Decatur Street right away. So that allows that to be used, the second and third of that. And then uh, the 30-minute parking along Broadway Street uh, near Mississippi Mutts. Second, third reading. Are there any items, uh, Council, that you'd like to see removed from the consent agenda? If not, we have uh, new ordinances. We have the record plat for Castle Rock subdivision, record plat for Eakin uh, first subdivision. We have the special tax bills. Uh, it's two different tax bills uh, to be uh, sent. Uh, is number 12, and then number 13 is the, our end of year operating expenses. Uh, which basically balances everything out from the budget uh, this year with the uh, um, cyber attack of quite a few things that uh, needed to be balanced after uh, uh, the end of the budget year. And then uh, 14 and 15 are regarding the tax increment financing redevelopment plan and the, and the redevelopment uh, uh, agreement. That's all. Any questions? Here. No. Thank you. There will be no closed session tonight. Okay. We will now move into regular session. Have the uh, roll call, please. Here. Robbie Gard. Here. Stacy Kinder. Here. Shelly Moore. Here. Dan Preston. Here. Nate Thomas. Here. Shannon Truxel. Here. I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. Motion made by Dan. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Nate. All in favor, say um, yes. Well, we did not this evening because Gail's on vacation and she has a part in that next process. We did, we'll do that August third. Yeah, for, for discussing what we were discussing, yes. Uh, motion been made and second. Any further discussion on adoption agenda? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. The agenda has been adopted. We have one public hearing this evening. 
a hearing to consider the proposed voluntary annexation of property located at 4072 State Highway K as requested by Mid-America High Mid Highway K LLC and the proposed zoning of the same property as C2 Highway Commercial District. Anybody here tonight to speak on behalf of the public hearing? My name is Dan Drury, President of Mid America Hotels. I guess I speak in behalf of doing it. I don't know what else I can say. <laughs> if you don't want us, we'll go somewhere else. No. <laughs> Anybody? I'm sorry. They love y'all. <laughs> Any questions for Dan? One moment. Please keep your comments to yourself. Whenever you have the appointment, then you heard the, the, okay. the thing. Please do all that. All right. I've been listening to it all night. All right, good. We just want to try to bring more jobs to town and and uh, open up some more of the opportunities. So, okay. took an old piece of property out there and want to totally renovate it. Okay, good job. Thank you. Any questions? I can't. I don't see any. All right. Thanks for being here, Dan. Anybody else to appear on behalf of the public hearing? If not, I will close the public hearing. Anybody uh, this evening to appear before the council for an item that's on the agenda? Any item that's on the agenda this evening? If not, we'll move into the consent agenda. Greg? Bill 2099, an ordinance amending Chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, by changing the zoning of property located at 920 North Middle Street in the City and County of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, from R2 to RUMD. Bill 2099, an ordinance amending Chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, by changing the zoning of property located at 920 North Middle Street in the City and County of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, from R2 to RUMD. Bill number 2100. An ordinance amending Chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, by changing the zoning of property located at 900 South Kings Highway in the City and County of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, from M2 to M1. Bill 2100, an ordinance amending Chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, by changing the zoning of property located at 900 South Kings Highway in the City and County of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, from M2 to M1. Bill 2100. And one, an ordinance amending Chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, by changing the zoning of property located on the north side of LaSalle Avenue, east of Baldwin Drive in the City and County of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, from C2 to R1. Bill 2101, an ordinance amending Chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, by changing the zoning of property located on the north side of LaSalle Avenue, east of Baldwin Drive in the City and County of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, from C2 to R1. Bill 2102, an ordinance amending Chapter 26 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, regarding speed limits and penalties. Bill 2102, an ordinance amending Chapter 26 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Cape Girardeau Missouri, regarding speed limits and penalties. Bill 2103, an ordinance accepting a permanent utility easement from Liberty Apartments of Cape LLC for property located at 1145 Walnut Street in the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Bill 2103, an ordinance accepting a permanent utility easement from Liberty Apartments of Cape LLC for property located at 1145 Walnut Street in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Bill 2104, an ordinance to repeal ordinance number 50176 regarding a permanent utility and sewer easement for unimproved Decatur Street right of way in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Bill 2104, an ordinance to repeal ordinance number 5076 regarding a permanent utility and sewer easement for unimproved Decatur Street right of way in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Bill 2107, an ordinance amending Schedule G of Section 26249 and Schedule R of Section 26248 of the city code by establishing 30 minute parking along Broadway Street in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Bill 2107, an ordinance amending Schedule G of Section 26249 and Schedule R of Section 26248 of the city code by establishing 30 minute parking along Broadway Street in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. You have before you the consent agenda. Moved. Moved by Robbie. Second. 
Second by Nate. Any discussion? Mayor, please mark uh, bill number 20-100 um, for me an abstention due to conflict of financial conflict of interest. Okay, I think that's recorded. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 20-108, the ordinance approving the record plat of Evel Evans Castle Rock subdivision. Second. Motion by Dan, seconded by Robbie. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 20-109, an ordinance approving the record plat of Eakin First Subdivision. So moved. Motion by Robbie. Second. Second by Dan. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. The motion carries. Bill number 20-1110, an ordinance authorizing the issuance of special tax bills on certain properties for the demolition of dangerous buildings and for nuisance abatements under the provisions of Chapter 7 and Chapter 13 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girard, Missouri. Motion by Dan, second by Nate. Any discussion? Um, yeah, the uh, the two properties are at uh, in the 1100 block of Gibney and the 1100 block of Bloomfield Street. They uh, uh, were condemned and, uh, and structures torn down. And now then, we're we are uh, uh, asking for a special tax bill. I believe on the Bloomfield one, we also had some um, some uh, nuisance uh, abatement uh, cost that we also wanted on the same provision. The overall process does that take? I don't. We it looks like in the notes it says the structure was condemned on September 10th of 2019. Yeah, but it's the, the whole condemnation process takes on the years prior to that by the time you get through the whole thing and then get it torn down. I think at one point we kind of said best case scenario they're about 18 months to two years if you start and every and everything goes smoothly. Um, it's it's a very cumbersome, difficult process. But you know, I, you know, on the other side of it is it's real property. It's you know we believe in people owning real property, and so it's a right that that's important that uh, that it is not just easy. Um, but sometimes when you're a neighbor of that, it's two years is a long time. Yes, it is. Any other discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 20-111, an ordinance appropriating funds for operating expenditures, capital expenditures, and debt service expenditures, and transfers for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020 in the city of Cape Girard, Missouri. So moved. Motion by Robbie. Second. Second by Shannon. Any discussion? Yep. Um, this is not just simply adding things to the budget. No. Yeah, and it's and it's the movement of things between funds that we do kind of on a regular basis in order to make things able. And when we get, um, for instance, when we get the grants, then it's adding uh, that we have a grant to pay for. And so then we make adjustments to that budget, and we do it typically at the end of the year. So there's a lot of that, and there's also uh, just un unforeseen expenses. Like we think we have a lot, you know, we spent quite a lot over time with. Uh, police and fire, and so we bring money for that. And uh, so yeah, sometimes it's, it's sometimes it's things in a previous budget that wasn't spent in that year, and it's spent in this year's budget, so it's got to be added to this year's budget too. So let those things come up too. Yes, those are will be covered. Uh, I don't think the inch. Yeah, some of that may be may be reimbursed by insurance, um, and then some of it would be from the emergency funds that we that we ask for. And on regarding the COVID uh, expenses, will those increase in funding by the amount of interest that we have? So far, we we do not have much federal um, available. Um, they are not. 
you know, our main, main expenses that we have has been um, lost revenue. Uh, but the, some of the expenses that we did have, we did submit to the county and they're looking at some of them. Some of them they have already reimbursed us. Okay. Uh, That's so, mostly the right. county. Yes. Yeah, the CARES Act that the county have, like for instance, we bought um, some devices to do CPR um, with basically a machine. Uh, and that allows you to do that without uh, contact. And so that was obviously a, a very much needed thing with COVID. And so uh, we purchased those and, and, um, and then the county reimburses for that. So basically, not misspeaking, if we get added unex unexpected revenue, whether it's through a grant or through emergency funding, we have not appropriated where that money should go. And that's what this is right. essentially doing is saying, it's okay to spend that money on XYZ. Right. Typically, we already bought the grant to you. This just balances yeah. the books. Yep. Any other discussion? Questions? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 20 112, an ordinance approving a redevelopment agreement in connection with the North Middle slash Broadway area tax increment financing redevelopment plan. So moved. Motion by Robbie. Second by Shannon. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 20-113, an ordinance de designating a portion of the city of Cape Girard, Missouri as a redevelopment area approving North Middle slash Broadway tax increment financing redevelopment plan, making findings related thereto and authorizing certain actions by city officials. So moved. Motion by Nate, second by Dan. Any discussion? Any comments? I think it's uh, it's great to have redevelopment downtown and looking at the two projects, two main projects here. One is which a behavioral and therapeutic service company on North Middle with a, with appropriate parking. The other is uh, the Rialto uh, retail and residential development, which involves two possible restaurants, one with an outdoor padding seating area, uh, two retail tenants and six apartment units uh, with, a, with parking for all of those. Uh, I think it's a great thing for downtown to develop good residential areas and also uh, commercial space too. So it's a neat deal. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. We have no appointments this morning. Any other business? No. If not, I'll entertain a motion we adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Is it okay to have a hot talk now? Ever since that hot mic issue came out, yeah. I've been pushing to have those guys removed from the oh, I'm going to keep pushing to have those guys removed from the that's because awesome. that's just not. Mm -hmm. So, thank you.